involves sharing best practices and we do that in several ways. We um, hold conferences, we do that via Twitter, webinars like today, um, survey results, we publish them and announce them at different conferences and we also have a forum um, and I'm hoping that some of you have actually joined our forum. Okay, so this is what it looks like um, and there's a lot of activity going on. Um, you can talk to people about different topics, have discussions. Um, there are hot topics going on at the moment. Um, we class Office 365 as a hot topic and so there are a few little discussions going on there. Um, so we urge you to join our community. The address is down at the bottom. Um, we also hold some of the um, videos of the webinars that we've um, had in the past. So as you can see, since 2014, there's a few um, videos on there on doing events. So please have a look. And this, that is where you will find this video um, after, let's just say, not today, maybe tomorrow. It will be put up there by tomorrow. So um, please join the forum. Okay, so we also share best practices um, through 60 Minute Tech Talks and our next 60 Minute Tech Talk is UCL's Connected Curriculum and that's going to be held on the 24th of January, 12.30 to 1.30 and our guest presenter for that event will be Dilly Fung and she's the Academic Director of, of um, the Centre of Advanced Learning and Teaching. And I'd just like to give you a little tiny bit of background behind um, this uh, tech talk. Um, in 2014, we published a survey and from that survey, um, 63 universities filled it in and we got 11 case studies from there. And so what we are doing or what we plan to do is to revisit some of these case studies to see where they are now with the project that um, they were sharing with everybody. So um, we are always looking for anybody that wants to share experiences or, or projects on hot topics with the rest of the community. So if you are interested, then just please email me lbarclay at sgul.ac.uk and um, I'll get back to you and you can talk about it. All right, so we also share best practices for our conferences and uh, we have one um, in 2017 called the Spotlight on Digital Capabilities Number 3 and it's Student Futures Equipping Students to Thrive in a Digital Age. So that's going to take place on the 24th and the 25th of May and at Southampton Solent University Conference Centre. And if you want to book a ticket, then uh, when they are publicised, please book as soon as possible because they don't hang around for long and um, the tickets do go very quickly. So if you want to find out more about that, you'll see that we've got an address down at the bottom of the slide. Um, if you go there, that's where you're going to find more information about it. But today is all about successful webinars and we nearly had a disaster right at the beginning because my sound wasn't working. <laughs> So Tim and Eileen are going to um, take us through how to run successful webinars. So over to you, Tim. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Neumann. I am uh, yeah, going through the webinar today. And uh, I, I should be right in your face at the moment. Uh, so welcome to this webinar and apologies for the earlier sound issues. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, so we'll go ahead if that's all right. I'm currently using the camera purposefully, but uh, during the webinar I will switch off the camera every now and then. Um, yeah, just as I see it fit, because this webinar is about learning how to do things, well, not necessarily right, but in a sensible way. Um, and we'll talk about all of these things. Now, let me call up my uh, slides and uh, then we can start the session properly. So the title is What Really Makes a Good Webinar? Uh, but before we uh, get into things, 
Um, let's go through some of the house rules. First of all, the use of text chat is really encouraged anytime. Thankfully, we have Gareth uh, with us today who will be keeping an eye on the text chat and alert me to any urgent issues uh, that uh, I might not see because I'm not going to monitor the text chat while I'm talking. I'm a man and a human being, so I cannot multitask. So the myth of multitasking has been completely debunked anyways by research, uh, and I'm terribly bad at it anyways. Uh, even at task switching, which is what we actually cognitively do when we are supposed to multitask. Um, yeah, so please feel free to use the text chat and talk amongst yourselves. I'm not taking any offense, uh, quite the contrary, I encourage that. Um, so if you want to talk, then I would ask you to raise your hand first. And uh, if you are not talking, then it helps to switch off your microphone. So keep your microphone button unpressed because it sometimes might interfere. Um, if there is too much interference, then I can switch off all of you in one instant. So uh, probably you don't need to worry that much about it. Um, also, if I find that video isn't helpful, I might close it off completely. Um, be prepared to use the whiteboard tools. We have a couple of activities planned for today. Do participate in polls. And most importantly, think about what you do. And to help us do that, uh, we're in a funny situation. We are doing a webinar about webinars. So there are two levels to it. Um, so while we are meeting here, we also, uh, ideally need to think about what we're doing here. And sometimes I'm breaking out of this presenter role and try to do the thinking for us or prompt a little bit of thinking. Now, when I do that, um, I thought about how can I signal that uh, I actually have brought some acoustic signals with me that you might hear during the session if I remember to do that. But most importantly, I'm relying on old technology, uh, the, one of the most usable technologies that there is. It's a piece of paper. So whenever I'm kind of going into reflective mode, I'm going to hold up a paper uh, which says meta. I hope it's in the right way around and not a mirrored image for you. Um, and that is then uh, the point when I'm addressing thoughts about the webinar and not the actual content. Right, so um, let's move on. So please, can you use the pointer, uh, activate the pointer of the whiteboard and answer the following question. How do you feel at the moment? Use the pointer and point to, uh, yeah, onto the emoticon how you feel at the moment. Uh, the pointer is in the top left corner. Uh, it looks like this and when it's active, it's actually filled in, but it's somewhere here. All right, we have uh, lots of smiley faces, which is very good. Uh, and lots of pointers moving around, so some people cannot properly decide. Um, uh, and can questions be repeated as text chat? Um, not always. I I'm, I'm, can't promise to do that all of the time, um, especially when things are moving a little bit fast. I have a new question for you. Um, how do you feel about this technology web conferencing, this web conferencing technology? Please point your uh, pointer towards the emoticon, how you feel about the technology, about using it, about moderating with it. Exactly, and thanks Gareth for typing your question. So um, there are still lots of smileys and a couple of anxious faces on the right hand side. Um, and maybe a little bit of confusion there. Um, all right, and we have a hand raised from Sai. Um, if you want to say something, then uh, feel free to just talk, or um, otherwise uh, you've taken your hand down already, so uh, maybe it wasn't a word. So, okay, uh, now for some meta thoughts, uh, this is an example of an icebreaker, obviously, and uh, we do need to get people trained in order to uh, allow them to participate fully in this webinar. And I like to do this with uh, some easy activities that aren't really cognitively challenging. So let's have a little bit of fun and move the pointers around. And um, I, if we had more time, I would probably have, have asked you to use additional tools to draw on the whiteboard. But I 
uh, reckon most of you are actually pretty experienced in these types of formats. So <clears throat> I'll skip the easy bits. But an amount of training is always required for participants to get the best out of the session. So the main question of this webinar is what really makes a good webinar? Um, and uh, let me now just, uh, let me turn this effectively into a poll. Oh, we have a complete newbie. Oh, I should have changed my colors of the text. Um, all right. So I'm going to um, start a poll now. I first need to number the items, which I haven't done in advance. So apologies for that. Um, and the poll has five choices and should be visible on your screen now. Please, um, well, vote for the for what you think is the most important option to what really makes a good webinar. Is it the content? Is it the session plan? Is it the presenters? Is it webinar tools or a combination of all of it? And I'll give you about uh, five more seconds before we close this poll. All right, uh, poll is closed and I actually did a mistake. I pressed the wrong button and uh, have hidden the, uh, uh, the responses. But let me tell you, um, so that's a beginner's mistake. Apologies for that. Um, so a combination of all of the above was the most popular choice by far. So that's a kind of an obvious choice. So uh, let's, let me delete this fifth option and uh, give you a four choice poll. So can you please respond again to the same question, but the fifth option is not available anymore. So if you were forced to choose your, uh, the most important tool uh, or aspect of what really makes a good webinar, then is it the content, session plan, presenter host, or webinar tools? Make a choice, please. And again, five seconds, four, three, two, one. Brilliant, and now I'll show you the responses. Um, so it's effectively uh, the content and the presenter uh, who you consider as the most important aspect. Um, less so the session plan, so preparation seems to be undervalued here in your group. Um, and least of it, the, web the webinar tools, which is actually quite interesting. We'll come back to that later. Now, let me actually remove the human element from that. Now, I'm asking you the question again, um, but you have three choices only. Uh, so if you were forced to choose between the content, the session plan, and the webinar tools, what would really make a good webinar? Content used to be the front runner just in the previous survey with four options. So I fully expect that content might be the front runner again, but you might change your opinion. And when you are f uh, have previously said the presenter host is the most important option, uh, let's see how you changed your opinion uh, because you were forced to choose for so something else. <coughs> right, here is the response. The content is still very popular, closely followed this time by the session plan. So preparation is probably not that undervalued uh, among you. Um, so thanks for that. And just as a meta thought, um, what I've currently done is I've just used the poll, normal polling tool for a quick response, but I've used it in successive fashion with eliminating options. And this is effectively something that people tend to forget about that they can, uh, yeah, you can effectively do this to drill down and uh, get deeper into the matter of things. And it's actually quite interesting how the, sometimes quite interesting how the uh, responses change. So, but the content effectively makes it or breaks it, apparently. That's your opinion. So no matter of how much polish you pu put over it, if the content's not right, uh, then the webinar has less chances of being good. Okay, thanks for that. So what the blurb for this webinar promised was this. Uh, promoting best practice for running successful webinars that people re will remember and talk about long after the event. That's a pretty tall order. And um, to be honest, I didn't wrote this 
blurb myself. So I was actually getting a little bit nervous when I read this, uh, but I signed it off. So um, yeah, no pressure. Um, I hope you will remember things and talk about some of the aspects, uh, even if it's just the duck whistle. Um, but I hope you talk about it for the right reasons afterwards. So um, the blurb also promised that we would go through these four points. Well, um, I might change things a little bit. So uh, what I want you to do uh, now again, please grab the pointer icon and uh, place yourselves on this graph. The vertical graph uh, is the number of sessions of webinar sessions or web conference sessions that you've done so far. And the horizontal graph is how confident you feel in leading webinar sessions. Um, so if you're very confident, uh, point yourself towards the right and then upwards or downwards, depending on the number of sessions, a rough estimate that you've delivered so far. And uh, we have a, an interesting picture here evolving. Um, which is that uh, we have two people at the moment who really are very, very experienced uh, with over 100 sessions. Uh, quite a big, uh, few who are in the 60 to 25 range, but most of you are actually between zero and 25. Um, uh, Eileen asks, can you say who you are? You would identify yourself in the text chat, actually. And interestingly, uh, so, so this, this whiteboard currently does not uh, automatically display the names. Other uh, products would do that, and I'll come to other products in a second. Um, but we do have a few people who have rather low or even no confidence, some average, some high, and some very high. OK, so that's effectively a really uh, good mix of people. I, when I read the part, uh, through the participant list, I was kind of assuming um, uh, we had more uh, regular users here. Um, that's not a bad uh, or good thing, um, the composition of this group here. It's just uh, this kind of thing informs me as a moderator of how to pitch things effectively. And uh, I have not used the poll deliberately because um, this is now an example of uh, a two-dimensional questionnaire, and the polls don't really capture that. Uh, so here you can have a visual overview of um, the experience and confidence altogether, which is actually um, gives you a different feel and different quality of the response. So um, as you can probably guess, the whiteboard is one of my most favorite tools in these web conferences, and we will use especially the whiteboard uh, in a much more detailed way uh, very soon. But let's get back to the agenda. Now, um, I have changed what I'm going to cover somewhat. Choosing the best tool, uh, I thought uh, that's a kind of a um, weird point, bullet point to have, because the best tool depends on the context, depends on the preference, um, what is best. Uh, so uh, it, I, I personally am of the opinion that it really depends on the context and the type of session, the format of session, the group of people you're with. So it's really difficult to identify a best tool that's universal. So I'm arguing more for purposeful use uh, of the various tools that we have at our disposal. Um, I'm also not really going to, uh, into the technical details of setting up and configuring tools here in this session. Uh, there are plenty of really, really good guides out there that do the job much better than I could in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, but I do want to talk about session formats. Uh, so what different types of sessions there are, because there are some questions that you have submitted in advance of the session, which I will uh, I'm going to manage. And I'm aware of the time, we don't have much time, so better get on with it. Uh, we'll talk about managing interaction and some tips for success, but not in a structured way, not doing one bullet point after the other, but interwoven in the activities that we are doing. 
So what I would like us to think about uh, is the terminology, because a webinar is actually a kind of a funny term, and um, uh, people have different uh, are calling this thing that we do here on the web in the, at the same time, uh, yeah, uh, different with different words. So what I want you to do now is use the whiteboard again but select the text tool, the button that looks like a T. Um, and uh, now I want to run this uh, in a group activity. So I am now going to uh, divide you into three groups. And the first group, um, and that might be a tip for you when you're running, when you need to uh, put people into groups quickly, um, if you were born in February, May, August, or November, then you should act on the whiteboard now. If you were not born in February, May, August, or November, then please sit back. You will be called in a minute. And uh, so uh, use the text tool uh, to write down terms, what we could call these alternative terms for webinars. You might call it uh, in a different way. There are loads of terms floating around. Can you just write, not your birth date on the whiteboard, but alternative terms for sessions like this? And I'll give you a few seconds to do that. You can repeat terms that are already on the whiteboard, and it doesn't matter where you put it, uh, just write it somewhere on the whiteboard. And we have quite interesting things. I'll add my bit to it, uh, but you won't know what's coming from me. Well, you might uh, guess comes up with it up there. And uh, yeah, I'll give you a few more seconds and then we'll move on to the second group. Uh, now it looks quite chaotic on the whiteboard, but that's all right. I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, please stop writing on the whiteboard now. We'll move on to the second group. So the second group, if you were born in March, June, September, or December, I'll paste it in the text chat in a second. Um, so if you were born in March, June, September, December, you will do something different. You are not taking the text tool. Uh, please take the uh, selector uh, icon. It's effectively the uh, mouse pointer tool, the leftmost button uh, above the whiteboard. Uh, if you take that, you can uh, choose any of these words on the screen and move them around. And I want you, uh, if you were born in March, June, September or December, I want you to sort the words on the screen um, uh, so that similar words are in a similar place on the screen. Now, some of you might grab the same word at the same time, which might make things a little bit chaotic, uh, but I'll trust that you sort yourselves out there. And all the others, you can lean back and watch what's happening on the screen. I hope that we can uh, bring some order into the current mess. And uh, yeah, we are getting there. Um, can you please move things closer together? Oh yeah, it looks much more orderly now, and it also gives us now uh, an impression of how many repetitions we have there. Okay, and if you want to add a term that's not on the whiteboard, then if you were born in March, June, September, or December, then you can do this now. And I'll give you five more seconds. Thank you, and please stop sorting. We have now a uh, well ordered whiteboard, and uh, now uh, the third group. Uh, so thanks for that. The third group, if you were born in January, April, July, or October, then it's your turn now. And what I want you to do is pick either the pencil icon or the shape icon, rectangle, ellipse, or line. Um, and mark the, the, the terms that you favor for this type of session. What's your favorite term? And circle it, underline it, or put some sort of uh, X next to it or whatever. What's your favorite term for sessions like this? 
and uh, we do not really have an agreement. So, but we have virtual classroom uh, is leading a little bit, or no, online seminars probably. And uh, interactive learning has one vote, and digital learning has three underlines. Now, what we don't know in this context is uh, one person could mark multiple things or one thing multiple times. So it's not really representative so in, in numeric terms. Uh, but that's all right. Let's get back to the meta level again. So what has this activity done for us? Uh, this is an example of using the whiteboard in a very simple way. Uh, and it's a three-step activity. In the first step, uh, you effectively do a brainstorm. In the second uh, step, you do an um, activity, uh, a sorting activity to order the stuff on the whiteboard. And that led to a really very quite structured whiteboard. Uh, and then the third step um, was to mark a favorite. And uh, yeah, we can. there is a text chat comment that there's no real consensus there. Uh, but that's actually the point. We have so many different terms. And I was the one who typed synchronous audiographic conferencing that somebody seems to have deleted, or I can't see it anymore. Um, and uh, whoever deleted that uh, actually uh, probably well done, because I think in terms of academic papers, I was one of, ah, it's still there, sorry. And somebody has, uh, yeah, somebody actually has uh, crossed this out, so to speak. Um, it's not used anymore. I think I was one of the last persons to ever use this term in an academic paper, and that was about uh, eight years ago now. So uh, it was uh, quite a popular term in the 80s, 90s, and uh, even noughties, uh, but then it fell out of favor. So this is the point where I want to bring my colleague in. Uh, Eileen Kennedy has been mentioned on the first uh, slide, and uh, what I want to do now is, um, Eileen, um, you have actually made uh, uh, posed a question on the uh, on, on the chat. Does the term we use give an indication of our approach? Actually, that's the question I wanted to throw back <laughs> at you. So, uh, because I know we spoke uh, previously about that, can do you have an opinion on that? Y yes, I mean, I think I think that potentially. Um, it, it could it could have a relationship couldn't it i mean one of the the things that um that, that i was thinking with you know i, I put like video conference in there i mean it's it's interesting that a lot of these terms like web conferencing and um even your audio, audio graphic whatever you called it uh thing i mean it doesn't mention the fact that you can have video and many many of our um uh, you know, experiences of webinars are the only you really video is not very well used, and it does strike me that that's kind of an important um, uh, element of of, um, of what we can do here. I mean, I don't know if video conferences are the best the best kind of um, approach, but um, I mean, virtual classrooms. I mean, virtual classrooms don't need to to be synchronous, do they? Um, so it, it does that kind of imply we think we have to you know have these kind of similar kinds of approaches to um a webinar than um as as we do with lectures for instance um i mean i'm just you know i just i just wonder if there's something um underneath the, the kind of terms we use Thanks, Eileen. And that brings us nicely to the next point. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, the different tools now a bit. And uh, you have make, made a reference to uh, videos. Uh, and video is certainly something that has become quite popular. Before we go into that, uh, this is effectively uh, something, um, an image that I produced probably about 10 years ago when the term synchronous audiographic conferencing was still uh, a kind of a hit in uh, among researchers. Um, and, and this effectively lists all the various elements that this environment has for us. Um, and video streaming back 10 years ago uh, still was suffering from bandwidth and quality problems, whereas nowadays uh, the, it has improved so much. Um, so uh, I uh, I have uh, yeah uh, Kim makes the dial-up comment yeah when we still are wor were working with dial-up modems although I think that was about 20 years ago um, then uh, that it was extremely difficult um, I have a kind of a 
defined approach to using video, I must say, and I'm sometimes misquoted as somebody who doesn't like video at all. Uh, I do like video, but only the purposeful uh, use of video. And my rationale for that is uh, actually a kind of a cognitive argument. Um, I personally don't think uh, having uh, talking heads on uh, on all the time is a purposeful use of video. The video can have a purpose. It sets the social feel. And um, I, I think uh, that that's something that you would probably also agree on, Arlene. Isn't that the case? The, the, the social function of video? How important yeah, is, yeah. is that? I think absolutely. I mean, I've taught a lot of um, uh, text-based online uh, classes where students um, have, you know, really missed not being able to see, not so much the teacher, or, uh, but, you know, each other. Um, and it just strikes me that, as you say, the purposeful use of video to show maybe um, students you know the face behind the name behind the words is is potentially the most valuable use of video um but you, i mean obviously that's that is tricky if there's a large number of of, of participants clearly yes uh so a good purpose is to establish the social presence what we call the social presence uh, because it makes the whole environment much more human but uh, if, if we are doing really stuff uh, that needs our attention and concentration, then actually there is uh, quite a bit of research out there uh, that, that shows that having a video thumbnail of a person who doesn't even look into the camera because the person looks onto the screen uh, is actually detrimental. <laughs> so I'm, I'm currently doing that to demonstrate that. And if you have watched me earlier, uh, then you will see that uh, I actually try to work with the camera. Of course, I sometimes need to look at uh, my windows on the screen. I have a dual screen uh, setting. Uh, this is my other screen here. Um, and so uh, that's a, another purpose of video, uh, to show things to people. Um, so I must avert my eyes away from the camera, but uh, I try as much as possible to address you out there um, who are participating in this webinar to really establish this connection and draw you in. And mm -hmm. also, when I'm uh, leaning back, I position myself uh, slightly to the side and not to the center because that's actually cheap in this video. Uh, um, so, you know, the framing and so on, you can do the Mr. Robots being in one corner the other way or so. Uh, so, if you uh, take some lessons from the film industry, then you can uh, make the image much more um, uh, interesting, I think. And cognitive load has been mentioned. Yes, that's effectively the uh, thing that really diverts our can divert our attention away. And there are so many tools. How to do we choose the correct one? And if you're in danger of uh, overloading the students, then just reduce it. But um, you, uh, well, but choose the tool that is really appropriate that you cannot do without in order to do the task or that brings something to it. Uh, I, right. yes. I, I think there is also something though about not being so concerned about how you appear uh, as well because uh, one of the things that's really difficult to get when you're um, so, I mean say so in the context of an online uh, class um, maybe it's different uh, in, in, in I don't know the the, the one-off webinar but you know that that sort of being able to sort of um, see people in their unguarded moments you know you can't really do that through text chat because everyone's preparing and that can give you know those you know when you when you look at people when they they um, they don't know you're looking at them that kind of thing that that, that can kind of really create a sense of uh, trust and somebody's saying it's humanizing and you know and and that's a, a really critical I think for, for online learning it can add so much yes in, in terms of what the research says about it that's actually quite interesting we, we have this cognitive load theory and there are then dual coding things and so on the work from Mayer and Sweller and so on that was quite influential there uh, which was about 10 15 years ago 
uh, a little bit earlier, um, and it still goes on. But the, the thing is, they have examined mostly stills image and how they interact with text or other means or uh, voice and so on. But they have not looked at video, and it seems to be quite difficult to analyze video. Now, the research thread of multimodality seems to uh, wants to address that, but um, it's uh, video is still quite a mystery. Uh, so I still maintain that we met, need to manage attention in these environments. Hence, I occasionally okay, switch off my camera. And there was actually a Can I switch off mine? If you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we, we are about to move on away from video now, <laughs> okay. and I just wanted to pick up, uh, there was, I think, uh, uh, a question in the text chat, as the session moderator, can you control participants' video, whether they can be seen or not? What uh, depends on the webinar tool that you use, the platform, and we are coming to platforms in a second. Um, in this environment that we are currently using, Blackboard Collaborative Ultra, I can switch off all of your videos and keep on mine. So uh, if some of you were to switch on their videos and I don't want that, then I can cut you off. That's the power of the moderator. And I just want to mention one um, thing which is affected pretty common sense. One of uh, the things that causes quite a bit of anxiety in the webinars Sudden silence, when suddenly, when suddenly nothing happens, that is quite disconcerting, and uh, people uh, immediately feel a little bit unsure uh, of uh, what, what's going on now. Have we lost the person? Because uh, if you can't see and hear anybody and not even see any screen interaction, uh, that very quickly becomes very scary. So one tip, manage the silence. Uh, so, and I think the best way is to demonstrate these things, uh, which I try to do, and apparently it seems to have uh, worked. So, here's a tip for you, try to manage expectations. I'm not saying that you cannot be silent at all, because you do need a sip of water every now and then, and Eileen is actually helping me with that. When she's speaking, then I can do some other things, and, because I need my attention as well. But tell the students when there is a break, when students are supposed to, or the learners, participants, when they are supposed to work on their own. Uh, tell them, and then it should be all right. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, this slide, uh, I'm just watching at the time. Uh, let's move on. I want to use the whiteboard in another hopefully novel way, and for that I'm going to switch off my camera because you need your full undivided attention. We'll, we'll play scratch cards now. So the idea is that you've used the pen uh, tool, so that's a third most button above the whiteboard, or the fourth from the right, and uh, I am going to ask you to fill in uh, boxes on a scratch card. Um, and if someone writes something over your box, then quickly choose another one. Uh, and yeah, it's exactly like you're doing uh, now. And uh, okay, so you have understood this concept. And uh, in a second, I'm going to uh, switch slides uh, and have you uh, respond by using Scratch cards. All right, can you please uh, stop uh, writing on the whiteboard now because I'm going to switch slides and it would make things messy. Um, by the way, whatever you're doing, do not click on the eraser icon, uh, right, and, and try to restrict your markings onto one little box. Okay, I'm going to switch slides now. Please stop doing anything for a second and now here's the question. So, which tools, so also choose the color, I haven't mentioned this. Please uh, first think, which of these tools listed, platforms listed on this screen have you used as a participant, then fill in the uh, scratch card in blue, as a leader, session leader, fill in the scratch card in green, as a, a just viewed a recording, uh, then fill it in gray, and if you've never used it, fill in the scratch card in red. And I'll leave you to it now for a few seconds.
Okay, the scratch card is filling up nicely. We have quite a lot of blue, as was expected. But the red is now getting more and more. And somebody has never used any of these tools and just drawn a large line. Or maybe it was a slip of the mouse. Okay, I'll give you uh, a few more seconds. Right, um, so thank you for filling in the scratch cards. And um, just as a kind of a meta thought again, um, this is a way to uh, quickly get uh, responses to uh, quite a complicated field because we now have a multi dimensional question with different uh, prompts. Uh, here on uh, which which are written out there, then we have different roles that you have used these platforms at or not at all, and that gives us a quick overview. Uh, Blue seems to be in the lead here, and there are quite a number of leaders of the various platforms. I can't really make out a platform that is leading the pack from these scratch cards here. Uh, Microsoft Skype seems to be uh, quite popular, as well as Adobe Connect. Um, yeah, but uh, so it's quite difficult to see numbers here. So what these colored scratch cards are good at, they effectively help you get a sense and trends and so on, and, and that works quite well. Now, I'm going to ask you to fill in scratch cards again. Um, and I am asking you a different question. I'm, uh, and the next question is, have you used, heard of, or never heard of these tools? These are also web conferencing platforms, but they're different ones. And now this uh, only fill in the use red card. Uh, the green blobs should go to the in the left scratch part of the scratch card. The blue things should go in the middle, and the blacks in the right. Oh, you picked it up. You're so good. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to finalize the spreadsheet. Great. All right, uh, so most of you have not heard of WYSIWYG, Open Meetings, or IBM Same Time. And uh, Citrix, of all these other uh, tools, seems to be the most popular tool in terms of usage, followed interestingly by Wizik, which also has a very red scratch card here. And then the big blue button in Citrix and uh, seem to be those that are in people's minds, but they might not have used them. OK, uh, so this is an example of a more structured thing. So when you want to get numbers, then you can use these uh, structured scratch cards quite easily. And again, it's a multidimensional question. And uh, it's quite a quick way of eliciting responses here. So and I am wondering, uh, Eileen told me that she needs to uh, leave a little bit early. Uh, but I now, in the remaining minutes, uh, I want to look at session formats uh, because I think uh, the, uh, well, this technology can be used in so many different ways. Um, uh, Eileen, can you probably tell us two or three of your applications that you have used? In terms of different, uh, different formats. Yes. Um, oh, well, okay. Um, well, one of my uh, less less um, uh, I think successful uh, experiences of of, of uh, running um, 
webinars, whatever we're calling them, um, was was teaching in um, uh, for for a university where they had already had a convention of how you did. Um, uh, video conferences and right, maybe, I think actually that's their term and it was very much you know the tutor presents and then the um, the the students never had their videos on never had their audio on um, and they they responded to polls and it was you know I found it very difficult to shift that because what I've really wanted to do before is to do obviously because you know I've learned from you Tim and you know I've, I've wanted to use these kind of tools make things very interactive um, and and see that, that that really the point is that you know that we could we, we can share experiences and, and, and maybe sort of um, construct uh, you know knowledge together during during a session like this as the most powerful way of using it but I found it almost impossible to do it because the conventions have been set within that situation um, that that uh, that I had to do it as a as a presentation I got very good at using the polling tool it was using Adobe um, uh, connect uh, but you know I was a bit disappointed with it okay um, yeah I've just I call up a slide here. So what you described is effectively the traditional remote lecture or remote presentation part. And uh, whereas we actually want to get to this uh, uh, activate uh, active uh, session thing where people don't just sit back but have some means of feeding back which goes beyond just asking text questions and responding to polls. And uh, yeah, I, I personally find the whiteboard the most powerful uh, tool um, for that. But uh, there are effectively uh, so, so many different ways uh, and uh, of, of using this technology. And I actually do have uh, like uh, eight potential case scenarios. Some people are using uh, this technology as a replacement for lecture recordings. Um, we've covered the remote lectures in online meeting environment. Uh, Skype is quite popular for that. And there was a comment in the text chat that Skype is very limited. Yes, but not uh, the uh, Skype for business because you can branch out in a full web conferencing environment with, with whiteboard and everything. And that makes it as powerful as, as this uh, environment here. Um, then uh, we have used uh, uh, the web conferences to connect two rooms together, two groups of people in different rooms, and we are investigating this a little bit further. And for income generation to sell seminars to the wide world, uh, to involve international students who can't come to the campus, uh, and an opportunity to address more people than the architecture allows. That is current. We are currently discussing this at UCL. And we are using what we call the hybrid mode uh, to teach students who are in the classroom and somewhere in the world at the same time. And um, this has particular challenges. Uh, so I'm uh, currently in the process of uh, writing up uh, the experience of uh, four groups uh, that have run this format at the IOE. And uh, these are the sessions where you really need help in the form of a second moderator. And uh, I think, Eileen, you had employed earlier with these hybrid sessions that there is a danger of who you're addressing, isn't it? Yes, well, I, I, you know, as a as a participant in in hybrid sessions, I know that, I, I, like an online participant, when there's been a live audience as well, it's always... You, you know you can feel a bit like a, a second class citizen because you can, you could obviously the 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 person who's running the session it's it, it's probably a kind of natural thing to respond um, first, you know, but if you, you, you know, if you ignored online, I think that there is a, a, a kind of general feeling that you, you, you can, um, you can get a sense of being ignored online, and it's, it's, um, uh, in all kinds of ways, you know, in, in text, uh, t text chats and, and so on. So it's, it's important, I think, to, to remember that the online people are really there, and they, and, and it might not be so easy for them to engage as well. So it's more powerful, I think, to be. Um, ignored uh, or included. Thanks, Eileen. And uh, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm moving towards wrapping up now. And what you've just said um, effectively leads me to uh, call up this slide here. 
the challenges of live conferencing that we have. Um, I think uh, they are effectively uh, three-part challenges. We need to grapple with the technology. Um, we need to understand the media. I'm, I'm separating media and technology because uh, the media is, is, is more than just knowing which button to press and uh, what thing to call up at which moment. It's so much more like what I said earlier, understanding the camera, playing, understanding the texture and working purposefully with, uh, with it and um, the whiteboard tool and all the other tools that are incredibly useful and serve probably only one single purpose, but when they are not there, you'll miss them. And one of these tools that I am missing personally is the Countdown Timer, which was in Blackboard Collaborate Classic, but has not yet made the jump to Ultra. So uh, as a countdown, I'm using my hands. It's a workaround that's a purposeful use of video again, but having a timer makes things a little bit easier. Now, uh, as, as I'm currently talking platforms, um, am I personally wedded to a particular platform no, not really. I mean, every platform has its advantages. What I like about that Collaborate, Collaborate Ultra is that it works in a web browser on WebRTC technology, which I think is the future, and other platforms seem to be moving uh, down that route as well. Uh, but then, uh, at the moment, I think Adobe Connect has the richest feature set of all. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, Microsoft Skype for Business, uh, the, the, the web conference, I think, uh, they have this nice approach of instant messaging integration so that you can jump from a normal phone call into a bloated web conference just like this. And uh, so uh, every, uh, every tool fulfills a function and has a good purpose. So if you would press me to ask what's your favorite tool, I can't really answer that. And uh, in the context of the Bloomsbury Colleges, uh, I was the one who was uh, kind of uh, asking people which do you prefer because we made some web conferencing reviews and have wrote the report for that. And it's incredibly hard to pick a favorite and to draw uh, a short list from a long list. That's really, really hard because they are so similar and there are hundreds of tools available and new ones keep appearing. Um, so yeah, technology, media and pedagogy. Uh, I think are the main challenges for designing good sessions and on pedagogies. These are the learning theories that I personally uh, find quite interesting. i happy to share slides with proper references where you can read more about these things. And I want to uh, show my last slide uh, with a tip, um, which is, uh, case scenarios. I was running a project uh, where we investigated different session formats and um, thinking about planning a session, I like really first to sort out what are the meta parameters of the session. And uh, so I am effectively thinking in my head how would I describe the formats, what skills are needed on the presenter's behalf, on the participant's behalf, what activities uh, are we running, uh, what's actually the mindset, what pedagogical model is behind in the sessions, and how can we embed it. And um, these headings actually help me personally uh, quite a bit to go through things. And uh, yeah, uh, so this is a different session format with different responses to the same headings. Um, and uh, this is a, a much more active session compared to the first one. And looking at the clock, I think we'll leave it at that. I actually want to have much more time for questions and answers. I'm so sorry that uh, I have overrun. Um, I think if we still have time for questions, I'm still around for a few more minutes. Um, if you have to leave, then uh, please do so. But uh, Lorraine still wants to say a few words, I think. Uh, not really. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, just like to thank you very much, Tim, for a wonderful session. Um, just want to remind everybody 
that um, if you have something that you want to share with the rest of the community, please email me at lbarclay at sgul.ac.uk. And the next webinar will be on the 24th of January, and that's UCL's Connected Curriculum. So I hope you can all join us there um, in January. So see you later. So if you want to hang on, please, um, I'm sure uh, Tim will answer any other questions that you can put in the chat or um, anything that you want to say now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Okay, thanks. And I will leave the recording on uh, for the time being uh, because there are a couple of uh, text chat questions that might be useful to, to record as well. For example, James S. asks, where could we find your work study of Nikno delivery um, once it's ready? Oh, that's a good question. I, I hope uh, in, in some, at some point, but uh, that those publication times are so long. So I... Um, it's going to be developed as an internal report first and foremost. So probably keep an eye on my Twitter feed, um, which is Tinman underscore Neumann and you um, or uh, yeah, maybe email me and I'll uh, if I don't forget send an email around. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well. Oh no, there, here's a good point. We'll publish it. I'm saying this on the UCL Digital Education blog, uh, which is uh, do I know the address on top of my heart? Uh, obviously not. Uh, I think it's UCL uh, blogs.ucl.at.uk slash digital dash education, um, which I'm just about to post to the text chat. So yeah, that's where we'll write a blog entry number. Um, so just going through, uh, if you have to leave, thanks for joining us. It's really great to have such a large number uh, of people online. It's quite a challenge to manage this group. Um, I'm just going through some text chat comments. Uh, Um, if you've tailored, uh, say you ask, if you've tailored interactive sessions for small uh, groups but more join, which platform allow you to restrict entry? Actually, I think pretty much most of the platforms do that you can close off sessions um, to new people. Um, unfortunately, I think that in Blackboard. Collaborate Ultra, I think it's not yet available. Uh, it's evolving quite quickly, but uh, a lot of the features that were available in the Collaborate Classic weren't there. But I have seen this feature uh, quite frequently on uh, most platforms, really. Uh, Elizabeth Charles from Birkbeck uh, makes a comment, uh, shared slides with references would be very much appreciated. Yes, I'll get in touch with Lorraine so that uh, sh uh, as you've all registered, uh, we can email those slides to you after the session. Um, and Lorraine has posted a comparison table of platforms, which uh, is also one reason why I didn't really go into this today. Um, I find him posted there. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of Skype, yeah, there was some confusion of that. The normal Skype has a really severe limit of just, uh, yeah, I think it's 25 people now assigned uh, typed in the text chat. Uh, Skype for business, where you can really run the screen sharing or the hoo-ha with polls and everything, uh, that has 250 uh, uh, if, if you want interaction. Um, and Gareth comments uh, 10,000 attendees for broadcasts. That's effectively following a similar model like Google Hangouts, where you can broadcast a virtually unlimited number. But if you want to have interaction uh, with people, then the limit is much, much more restricted. Uh, yeah, there was a comment on comparing Collaborate Ultra with uh, Adobe Connect. Uh, yes, uh, Collaborate Ultra are scaling up at 250 and probably more users in the future. Um, 
yeah, the best bit is that it's web-based with no Java, no down notes. Well, it still uses Flash if you're not using the Chrome browser, but um, maybe in the future this uh, with, will also uh, be um, removed um, as we, as the world moves towards WebRTC, which is the underlying technology, which is a shared standard. Um, right, iPad was mentioned throughout. Uh, yes, uh, well, the, the support of mobile devices is getting better and better, but it still is somewhat restricted. Uh, you can't do everything on a mobile device that you can with a desktop uh, or laptop. Um, so there's still the case of using uh, proper computers. Um, but uh, most basic functionality, uh, like text chat, video, audio, and a little bit of whiteboard drawing is possible. And there was an earlier question whether I have used the scratch card technique with an app. Uh, to be honest, I have not. Um, so if there were some app users today in the audience uh, and they were able to uh, participate, then uh, that would have been a really uh, good case study. It should work uh, if you have access to the whiteboard. So, um, and I have missed the most recent Chats uh, are Robert's uh, okay. Yeah, saying 50% of your cohort will access webinars via an iPad. Oh, that's actually quite a significant number. So, uh, yeah, I think it's moving that way that mobile devices like tablets will be supported more and more. And frankly, they have to. They are just great for whiteboard interaction, uh, much, much better than drawing with a mouse on the screen. And just use the finger or a small pen and draw directly on the screen. So, um, yeah, uh, I hope we'll see more support of these tablets, better support of these tablets in the future. Um, right, I think I have addressed most of the questions. So, thanks everybody. I will now stop the recording. And if you're watching the recording, Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.